Today, my special guest is Jeremy Walker, and we're going to be discussing his book, Passing Through, Pilgrim Life in the Wilderness, which is published by our friends over at Reformation Heritage Books. Jeremy, it's great to be speaking with you again. Welcome, I say, welcome back to the show, but really this is a new show, so welcome to the new show. Thank you, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. Now, uh, you're you're over across the pond, so for me, I'm just waking up. I'm, I'm having my first cup of coffee. You're almost to lunchtime over there. Yeah, I'm I'm well into my third or fourth <laughs> cup of tea for the day. So. <laughs> now, for for you, is are are you do you drink coffee at all, or is it mostly tea? No, I I do drink coffee from time to time. I I do like espresso. That's probably what I'd I'd, I'd go for naturally. But uh, yeah, tea 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 or coffee. But uh, probably the drink of choice is going to be a mug of tea. Okay, good to know. Good to know. And uh, uh, my friends from the UK, I've I've been privileged with the people I've worked with through the years to know a lot of people uh, from across the pond. And they tell me the the tea we have here in the States is kind of like the floor sweepings that you guys send over from England uh, for us to buy over here. (laughs) I I couldn't say where your tea comes from. Um, I've I've drunk some very fine tea in the States, uh, but uh, my wife, who actually is American, does she, even she tends to send me if I'm coming to the states? She she normally just slides a little packet of tea bags in there for for friends over there and okay. also a, a sort of traveling stash. <laughs> well, th- thank thank you for uh, helping me to know that that is true. I, I I'll I'll try to avoid our tea over here. It sounds like and, and look for good tea for my friends when they come visit me here from the UK. There you go. Well. Uh, our last interview was back in 2013, so I think it'd be good just to reintroduce yourself to the listeners. So uh, take a few moments and tell us about yourself. Well, I'm one of the pastors of Maidenbower Baptist Church, which is in Crawley in West Sussex in the southeast of the UK. If that doesn't mean anything still, uh, think of London. Draw a straight line south from the center of London to the coast. And Crawley is pretty much halfway down that line, right next to Gatwick Airport, which is one of the major international airports in the southeast. Uh, I'm one of two pastors in the church. Uh, we're a fairly small uh, Reformed Baptist church or independent Baptist church. And um, I'm, I've been a pastor there for just over 10 years. Uh, I've been married to my wife, Alyssa, for about the same period. God's blessed us with three delightful children. And my uh, primary responsibilities are there in the church, preaching, and pastoring, and uh, I pretty much take what opportunities the Lord's pleased to give me in terms of uh, preaching, teaching, serving, uh, that includes writing in, in other spheres. So that's that's it. There's, there's not a great deal to say. <laughs> well, and I, I love that the background behind you is uh, bookshelves full of books. That's the, the appropriate background for an author and a pastor. So uh, uh, it's, it, this is this is this is probably the neatest view. It's, this, this goes this goes on three sides, and then there's the piles behind. So <laughs> no, I'm I, I'm with you. I'm I'm in my office at work here, and this view is very strategic. Um, you know, you can kind of see my bookshelves behind me, but the stacks of paper kind of flow out the sides right. that you can't right. see. So you're not you're not alone in your strategic placement of your camera. Well, it's less less strategy and more good fortune. I think. <laughs> Uh, well, so you have a new book from Reformation Heritage Books, and I know every book has its own unique backstory. Uh, so I'd be curious to hear, how did the idea for passing through, where, where did that begin in your mind? How did that get started? Sure. There were two or three streams, I think, that sort of flowed in to the, uh, the river that this book became. Um, on the one hand, there was the generic tension, I guess, that there always is personally and pastorally in terms of what it means to be Christians in a world that is fallen, that will one day be renewed and in which we are, we're pilgrims. Uh, my, I guess some of my own reading appetites have always stirred up that sense in me. And I do think that it's a sense that many, perhaps especially in the modern West, have increasingly lost. There seems to be either a disregard or a carelessness uh, for the notion that this world is not really our home, or in some circles, even what seems to me uh, an appetite to try and make this world as much home as possible. Uh, And that seems to neglect 
both the positives and the negatives that scripture brings to bear on this whole issue of, of where we really belong and how we act along the way to getting there. So with that, some of the other writing and, and interacting that I've done with people, uh, I was asked to, to give a couple of addresses at, at, at different conferences that began to, to, to flow into this theme. I came up with a brief outline and the more I wrestled with that, the more I tried to develop it, I thought, well, I hope that this would be profitable, first of all, for the, the, the saints that I serve here in, in the UK, in, in the church where I am, and then, God willing, more broadly. Uh, and when I floated that past the uh, the friends at Reformation Heritage Books, they seemed very eager uh, to pursue that. And so I tried to draw all those strands together, funnel all of the, the thinking, the preaching and the writing um, into into one stream and passing through as a result. Well, I think uh, a lot of folks, when they see the title, they're going to probably think of Pilgrim's Progress. Does that does that play into the title? Is that kind of a, a play on words in a way? Um, the, the title itself is is actually shared with a poem written by Horatius Bonner. Uh, and I put that poem in right at the front there. Uh, he begins, I walk as one who knows that he is treading a stranger soil, as one round whom a serpent world is spreading its subtle coil, uh, one who feels that he is breathing ungenial air, for whom as wiles the tempter still is wreathing the bright and fair. My steps I know are on the plains of danger, for sin is near, but looking up I pass along a stranger in haste and fear. But he also ends, for thee it's God, it's King, the long rejected, earth's groans and cries, for thee the long beloved, the long expected, the bri thy bride still sighs. So I, I came, I had the title passing through before I read the poem and I thought, okay, uh, someone else has been here before, but also Pilgrim's Progress and the Holy War, probably Bunyan's two best known works, they, they've been seminal texts in terms of my Christian life and experience. And when I'm trying in the early chapters of the book to establish this notion of the pilgrim identity, I've spent quite a lot of time in Bunyan's passages on the pilgrims in Vanity Fair, uh, because that seems to me the point at which he's really talking about what it means to be passing through this present world as God's people. Uh, set the stage for us a bit with what you explore in the book. I'm, I'm curious... What's the tension that you're inviting the readers to deal with? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I guess maybe maybe apply that to some of the things that they're facing in, in, in their everyday life. How, how, how would the things they're facing out there in the world from day to day connect with where you're bringing them in the book? Okay, well, the, the, the rough outline of the book, the sort of trajectory that we trace, I begin the first couple of chapters trying to identify and defend this scriptural motif of a pilgrim and talk about some of the ways in which as Christians and as the church as a whole we can miss our way in this. We can either uh, isolate ourselves entirely from the world and sort of throw up the barriers and lock all the doors and hope that those horrible people out there don't get into us. Uh, we can either just ignore everybody and, 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 and get on with life and, and just hope that no one will touch us will just be left alone or you find people who really imbibe the spirit of the age and dive into the world around them and the world becomes very much like the church and my contention is that any one of those is an unbalanced and inappropriate and essentially unscriptural response that there is in in the word of god a simultaneous separation and engagement that is required of us. And actually, if we grasp our identity as a pilgrim, then we know what that separation means and what that engagement means. And once that's established, the balance of the book offers 10 principles for pilgrim life in the wilderness. And it's, I wouldn't want anybody to think that it's, um, a sort of a, a an overwhelmingly negative book. My, my my intention throughout is to give positive helps and directions 
to God's pilgrim people. So there are certainly things that we have to take account of. Uh, if I just give you sort of a, a sense of where we're going. To begin with, we need to understand the environment. Then we need to know the enemy. We have to fight the battles, pursue the mission that we're given. In doing that, we respect the authorities. So when you think about uh, elections and uh, the civil authorities that God himself has appointed, whether or not they're more or less positive toward Christians, whatever kind of oppressions we face, how do we think about and respond to both our present situation and what seems to be the likely possibility or probability that more and more Christians are going to become uh, excluded and oppressed in society? Relieve the suffering. What does it mean for the church to, uh, to show the mercy and the kindness of God in the world? Appreciate the beauty. It's a fallen world, but it's, it's, there, is, there is goodness, there's common grace, there's favour that we receive from God. But then as you come toward the, the end of the arc, as it were, appreciate the destiny, cultivate the identity and serve the king. So we, to use the old phrase, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. And without trying to be exhaustive, here are 10 principles in which basically I try and survey some key scriptural data, uh, summarize the lessons that we learn from that, and then offer counsels in these various areas. How do we think? And how do we act in the light of that identity? Now, when you were working on the book, was there a particular ideal reader or intended audience that you had in the back of your mind? Uh, I would hope that anybody who's who's serious about what it means to, to live as a holy person, to live as someone who's set apart to God and therefore called to glorify God as they make their way through this world to the world to come, would, would have an appetite for what I've tried to do. Uh, there may be people with some significant questions. Um, I would hope it would be a challenge to people who've perhaps become over familiar with or, or too deeply rooted in the world, but also a challenge to people who, who've, who've backed away and perhaps have missed their privileges and their duties with regard to the service of God in this world. Uh, you know, Christ doesn't pray that God will take his people out of the world but that he'll keep them in it. Uh, Paul speaking to the Corinthians, he says, you know, you're going to have to deal with the godless people in this world. What you do as a church with regard to sin, that's clearly, clearly defined by Paul. But he also says that, that the sinners who, if they continue unrepentantly in their sin, would have no part in the life of the church in that sense. Those are the very men and women you've got to deal with day by day in the world. So these are the sorts of tensions that, that I'm trying to, to address. There are not always absolute and black and white answers to the question, what do I do if? But what I'm trying to bring out is some of the, the, the principles from the word of God that help us to organize and respond to these challenges. Well, let's say somebody sits down with the book. Some of these concepts are new to them. They work all the way through. Uh, is there a certain theme you hope they come away with or, or, or a call to action you'd like to see them move forward with after they've gone all the way through the book? Well, I think in the, in the broader sense, I would like them to grasp that they are a pilgrim, and to understand a little more of what that's going to mean in terms of how they think and feel and act in the world. And for different people, that, that will probably mean different things. For some people, it may mean you open your door and you get out there and you start talking with people. Uh, for other people, uh, it might be something like, OK, I've got to hunt through my, uh, my Internet history my DVD collection, my uh, sort of, I don't know, Netflix favorites, whatever it may be, I've got to start thinking about what it means for me to be separate from the world. So for some people, it may be I need to be holy 
in order that I can properly engage with the world. For others, uh, I need to be holy, therefore I need to separate from the world at, at these points. But I, I would, what I would love, I, th I think, would be really for people to come away and say, Christ has purchased me with his blood. And if that is so, I am called to live every moment of my life to the praise of his glory. And, and this, this motif and the way it's worked out, this shows me more of what that's going to mean for me. And, and I would hope, too, that if someone reads it and says, I'm not a pilgrim, that they would say, I, ne I, I need to be one and I would love to be one. This is, this is a Christ who can be trusted and is worthy above all of being served with all that I am and all that I have. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, many authors will tell me that they're personally changed, you know, when they're on a, each writing journey as they're working on a new book. Uh, it, were there some significant ways you were personally impacted as you were working on passing through? Writing for me is, is always a good way of processing what I'm thinking. Um, and so uh, as I'm starting off with the initial plans, as I'm wrestling through the, the scriptural material, as I'm trying to think uh, to, to the extent that I'm preaching some of these things, you always have to preach them to yourself. So for me, I think it, it was a matter of grinding it deeper into my own soul, um, working it, working it out, um, facing myself some of the particular challenges. Uh, it's all well and good to tell other people, "Hey, how about doing some of this?" But but you have to do that yourself. I mean, you, you have to sit in front of your own computer screen. You have to uh, walk through the world. You, you have to uh, listen to things, look at things, process things, pursue things. And working through material like this for me challenges me, and I hope keeps challenging me, to, to filter life again through, the, through a scriptural grid uh, and, and see how much needs to be either dredged out or swept away in order for me to be the kind of man that I wish to be, the kind of uh, man of God I trust, husband, father, uh, church member, pastor, friend, evangelist. All, all of those roles and functions, uh, I, I think, need to be informed by this, this mentality that I am here, but I don't belong here. And as I make my way to what is my true home, then then I need to show every step of the way where I really belong, uh, and 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 demonstrate that in with, with the greatest possible integrity and Christlikeness. Now, do you have a copy of the book handy near you? I think you said you just yeah. got yeah, one. So I, can you hold I that got, up for I us? My copy. I got my copy. <laughs> yes, it's, it's like yeah, it actually arrived. This is great. So here it is. I hope that's uh, coming through. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah, now this, um, I, I hope I'm not too fussy. Reformation Heritage will have to tell you that. But I, I found this this photo online and I thought, that's just what I'm after. You know, this this road, a straight line, it's got its ups and downs. There are clouds overhead, but there's brightness in the future. And uh, I said to them, something like this. And the guys there tracked down the, the man who took this picture. <laughs> and uh, I don't know quite how, but he was he was kind enough to, 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 to make that available. So, uh, yeah, this is it. Great. Well, I, and I think it's, it's always a lot of fun when an author can have input into a cover design that really gets the, you know, portrays the message they're, they're going for in the book. And I, I don't know how other authors think. For, for me, the whole thing kind of... It's, it's it's a it's a unified whole in my mind. It's, I've got this great idea, and it all hangs together. But uh, yeah, now uh, we've talked in the past. You have a, a number of other books, but uh, since we're focused on a, a new book from Reformation Heritage Books, uh, do you have any other books previous or in the works with uh, RHB that you could take a moment to tell us about? Yeah, sure. Uh, the one the one before this. Um, 
with Reformation heritage is called Life in Christ. And uh, this is uh, an exploration of salvation in terms of the experience of the person being saved. So it begins with what it means to look to, the, to Christ in faith, uh, God's call to us to come to Christ in order that we might be saved and then works through what it means to be united to Christ, the riches of Christ, uh, what what adoption means to be a son of God, how we may know that we are children of God, the, 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 the beauty of assurance, and then the, the way that we can be assured, the fact that we are a work in progress, that God is working in us, and that we therefore are working out our own salvation and and then again our, our final expectation that uh, we're looking forward if we've walked in a path of righteousness to a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will give to to us on that day so that's that's the the, the sense my, my experience in this life of being saved uh, and then RHB have also been kind enough to, I think, accept in principle a little booklet on repentance. That's part of a series on practical Christianity that they're doing. Hopefully that will be out uh, later this year. And if they'll permit me to mention something I've done for another, uh, Cruciform Press have just published uh, a short treatment called Anchored in Grace, uh, which uh, really focuses on God's gracious dealings with sinners in salvation. Uh, so, Life in Christ, Passing Through, both available now. The booklet is forthcoming. And the, cru the, the cruci uh, Cruciform book, you said that's one that's just released? Yeah, I think that's 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 coming out this week. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a freak. I don't sort of get two books published every week <laughs> or even every year. Uh, no, it's just... Uh, again that that's just part of the outworking of this you know what what am i here for i'm here to serve god glorify christ uh if someone gives me that opportunity i may not be able but i want to be willing so uh i'll take take the take the chances as they come god helping me <laughs> well and we talked back in since we're just going to touch on all of your books today um uh, okay. we talked back in 2013 about a book that you published with evangelical press or ep books as we often know them here in the states mm -hmm. Um, I'll be sure to include a link in the show notes for, uh, for that episode. So if folks want to go back and listen to our previous interview, they certainly can. Uh, but tell us a little bit about that book as well. Uh, the New Calvinism Considered uh, was the title of that book. And it was really uh, the, the subtitle, A Personal and Pastoral Assessment of the Movement that's been known as the New Calvinism. Um, it it tried to give what was, albeit from my own perspective, a, a fair and appropriate and careful and I hope affectionate as appropriate critique, uh, assessment and critique of the movement called the New Calvinism. I looked at some of the uh, the more positive aspects that have, that have developed in that, uh, warned about some of the, the negative elements considering and, and this was really the vital thing uh that i think not everybody was quite uh, willing to grasp <laughs> the new calvinism as a, as a spectrum and at one end of the spectrum or with some individuals anywhere along that spectrum there are going to be some some positives some good things where other good and godly men and women could say that's 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 good that's healthy that's right and yet at the more dangerous end of the spectrum and with certain individuals who are holding some strange things together in tension there are going to be things where i would hope that a, a scripturally minded christian is going to say yeah that that's that's a matter of of serious even grave concern uh it was in the response has been interesting um a number of people have very graciously said that it helped them to, to situate and to navigate through some of these issues. Uh, some of the people who uh, were addressed in the book, the, the names who were identified, gave me their own feedback. Uh, 
the, the ones the ones who did so personally have been unfailingly gracious uh often uh, appreciative even if they didn't always agree uh i've been shot at from those both sides those who've said uh why aren't you just you know going in there with all guns blazing and taking down everyone and everything that's remotely associated with this movement uh, and others for whom daring to lay a finger on the the man of the moment is considered the crime of the century um but as as you look at what has happened since a, since writing a book that was really a snapshot of a, of a particular period i would i would hope that fair-minded readers might say that at least some of the things that i was dealing with some of the suggestions i was making some of the fears i was expressing some of the counsels I was suggesting uh, have been in some measure vindicated by, by subsequent events. So uh, whether or not that's still useful, I, I, I hope that it is, um, but I couldn't, couldn't say for sure uh, how, uh, how it's being uh, read at the moment. Yeah, I think it would be an interesting read for people to go back and consider the time frame when that book released and what was going yeah. on. And like you said, a lot has changed and shifted in that movement since the book was published. So in hindsight, I think it would be very fascinating for people to look at where we are today versus where we were when that book first came out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, again, with all the books, I'll be sure to include links in the show notes for this episode. Uh, this video is going to go out ahead of the podcast episode. So while you could certainly go to SeanTabbitt.com right after you watch the video to find links to all of Jeremy's books, they probably aren't going to be there for a few weeks. So just keep that in <laughs> mind. Uh, uh, obviously, Jeremy's books are going to be available on Amazon and other places uh, where good Christian books are sold. Obviously, the different publishers' websites will have them as well. Uh, if people want to learn more about you, your books, Jeremy, where's the best places for them to try to connect with you on the web? Uh, I guess the key the key places, apart from the the publishers' websites, would be the church website, which is. Uh, you can search for Maiden Bower Baptist Church. It's Maiden as in young woman, Bower as in uh, small shelter, uh, all one word, Maiden Bower Baptist Church uh, or www.mabach.org. That's M-A-B-A-C-H. Uh, I have a personal blog at The Wanderer. Uh, again, you can search The Wanderer with my name. Uh, I've written from time to time at Reformation 21. Uh, those are probably some of the, the key places. And uh, for the church's website, do you sometimes put your sermons up there as well? Uh, yes, uh, there's a sermons page there, and that links through to our sermon audio uh, web page. So uh, pretty much uh, all of our regular public ministry is going to be online there. Okay, well, that's very helpful. Uh, for those of you who want to connect more with Jeremy, uh, again, I'll be sure to include links to all those places he's mentioned in our show notes as well. And sadly, it's time to bring another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Uh, I, I could continue these conversations for hours because I have so much fun with them, but there are time limitations. So, uh, But many thanks to all of you for being a part of our conversation today about passing through. Uh, for more on the book, you can check out the publisher's website, which you'll be able to find at heritagebooks.org. And Jeremy, just want to thank so much for coming back on the show and sharing with us today. It's always a great pleasure to speak with you. Thank you, Sean. It's been a delight to chat again about uh, passing through and, and the other books. And thank you to those who are watching and listening as well for taking the time to, to hear what we've got to say. It's been a, been, been a pleasure.